project. Okay, so, great. I mean, the first question is, um, can you tell me something about your sense of God's calling into missions and how you came to understand that missions was your avenue for life? Sure. Okay. It's dangerous to ask missionaries to tell their story. It can go on forever, but I'll try. I've done it many times. So, um, in the 90s, I was studying construction and business at a secular college, but doing youth ministry on the side. Uh, after coming back to the Lord at age 18, a few months before I went to secular co- college, I came back to the Lord because it was I started a prayer life again. And I was excited to have Jesus, the idea of Jesus inside was my thing, because then it all changed from the inside out rather than try to because I wasn't so much in any Christian world before, even though my family went to church. Um, loved youth ministry. And after the, um, I did a semester in Europe, abroad, in Denmark, and I stayed with a family that host, hosted all these Mormon missionaries who were on their way to Eastern Europe because the, you know, the Iron Curtain had fallen. So before you couldn't do youth ministry, even if you were a Czech, and definitely not a missionary coming in. Um, but I I just grew in college and loved youth ministry. And then at the end of college, I started to pray, what construction company should I work for? And I didn't have school debt because my mom worked at the college. And I the, mo- the money didn't really motivate me, the big money you could make with construction. Uh, so I was praying, and I heard the quote, um, not during prayer, but just somewhere. The world needs more professional, I mean, more passionate, not professional people. So I asked, what is my passion? Man, it's youth ministry. I always want more time to do that. So within probably a week or 10 days, I got the answer, go into youth ministry. But I could not determine whether that's uh, young life in a, the U.S., which is, you know, outreach oriented, because I'm more of a, I've never been called to be a in the church worker, but everything I want to do blesses the church and be a member, but I'm more of an evangelist than a, than a um, staff member. And so I couldn't decide between youth ministry with Young Life or Josiah Venture, which I had got, an ex- got exposed to when I was studying in Europe. After the semester finished, I went to check and did some camps and um, learned all about it. Didn't initially fall in love. You'll hear a lot of missionaries. They, they sometimes they they go because it's a calling, not because the place is wonderful. That's one thing, or because it's uh, because you just love the people. You don't love the people yet. You just met them. It's like yeah. you you don't love people from the country of Cameroon, if you don't know anybody, I mean, you're supposed to, but you don't because you never met them. So I didn't necessarily love them, but um, then I spent months deciding USA or Czech. And in the end, I didn't get an answer. So I just trusted God to go towards Czech because they said the boat won't work. The rudder on the boat won't work unless it's going. So go in one of the directions and trust God will stop you. That's one way to maybe find his will. And Czech kids had not heard the gospel, whereas most of the Euro- the U.S. kids, they needed a reminder, but not that they never heard it. So um, that's what I did. And I had to go to mission school because you need training for this work. You don't want to just be ambitious and show up. A lot of missionaries in the capital city of Czech, Prague, have come and gone. It's a revolving door. It's it's miraculous to to be in Czech this long because especially starting in the 90s as I moved in 1999 it was just nobody was learning the language, nobody was staying for long as missionaries, nobody was learning the culture. It's a very put offish culture until you're in, then you're really in. So that's my story about the beginning. Mm. And so what does your uh, ministry look like now? What is, uh, yeah, I guess, what, yeah. what do you, I don't yeah. want to say do. But, yeah, yeah, no, that's, um, the, the ministry is both being and doing. You be a Christian by connecting with Jesus because no good will come, no fruit will come anyway, John 15. 
And the doing is just keeping your eyes on Jesus and then going and tell, telling people that God loves them and the way through God and the meaning of life is knowing God and it's through Jesus. And then um, exposure to the Bible. And at this point, I used to spend all, my first four years, I spent all my time just with youth and lost youth, mentoring Bible studies, spending time where they are, just out there doing camps, doing weekends, doing sports events, playing on a basketball team, just being a lot. Sometimes I was so with the non-believers um, that I probably needed a little more structure to get the word into their lives because it's great to be with them a lot, but you're not there to entertain or just play sports with them. You're share the gospel. So, but But then I realized that this work won't go forward unless the checks are the ones that are doing the work and multiplying themselves. Uh, and so now a lot of my work is one-on-one -on -one with Czech youth pastors. Either this material that we have, walk them through it. It's like the six emphasis of Jesus ministry. And we can copy that in our ministry. You know, the Bible having vision, having love, having relationships, um, those kind of things. Uh, and then another thing I do is just online coaching. I say, what do you want to talk about this meeting? And they, since they're already mature, they come up with something that they need to talk about. And then I use the coaching method, the Christian coaching method, to ask them questions to help them hear from the Spirit and choose what they need to do, not what I think they should do. So half of my, well, now all of my work is online, <laughs> but before that, it's just, you could say a lot of time with youth and a lot of time with their leaders, uh, doing reach out, outreach and building. So youth ministry. Awesome. That's really cool. Um, did you do, before you moved to the check, um, did you do much ministry, uh, youth ministry yeah, but in, in America. Yeah. Um, five years of volunteer, young life, ministry, summer camps, okay. go to the schools, see the kids where they are, and also invite them to our Monday night event. But it was half and half, invite them to see them, and half just show up where they are at, at work, at mm -hmm. school, at a sporting event. So five years of volunteer youth outreach, youth ministry, and... I don't think our organization would, I think they would want me to have be more experienced now if they were to recruit me. But back then it was kind of not as organized or whatever. But, but at the yeah. same time, when I moved over there, I was 24. And you don't, it, it's hard to learn languages when you're older than that. It's hard to change your ways when you're older. I changed all my ways and I learned the language because I was young enough and I worked hard at it. Whereas... People past 30, it is really... I mean, it's always hard to learn these languages. Polish or Slavic or Russian or Czech. But especially if you're older. And plus, you don't adapt to the Czech ways as easily when you're older. And plus, you're at almost you're their age when you're that young. So I would say it's okay to recruit young young missionaries. But you have to... I got a lot of training on the field, um, which is good. And so what would you say maybe is the biggest uh, difference in where you are in the Czech versus ministry back in America? Well, it's been a while. It's been 21 years since I've ministered in America to youth. <laughs> um, but if I can go back and remember, youth youth are melding into similar, you know, they're all, yeah. you know how it is. The world is becoming flat and becoming <laughs> like each other. <clears throat> I basically had to to start over in youth ministry as far as methods because they the Czechs don't do the crazy stuff. They're just not mm -hmm. a crazy culture. Um, they are at camps if there's Americans and then they have an excuse to be a little crazy. But you basically it was it was like the principles apply but not the practices. So mm. so it was hang out with them, study and read the Bible together. Um, prepare a meeting that will meet these kids' needs 
and don't do it the American style. So it was, I even had to learn new hobbies because like golf wasn't an option and I'd played a lot of cheap golf growing up and things like yep. that. And fall, what you do in the autumn is totally different. So it was a restart, both in work, ministry, and you have to be willing to lose your ways um, and and start again. The culture was just different enough. It wasn't Western. It was, it wasn't third world. It was second world, communist, mm-hmm. not first world. So a lot of learning curve. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, so then, if you could tell someone something who is interested in missions um, that they really should focus on learning or growing in as a person prior to coming into a new cross-cultural setting, what might be something that you see as key for specifically in, in cross-cultural youth ministry? How to, how to prepare for it best? Yeah, or, or like, yeah. That and also like character wise, what are what are important character traits for for grow, going into a cross cultural setting? Yeah. Well, the classic is if you're not doing that work and don't like extra pressure, don't put extra pressure on yourself. But if you're not doing it in your own culture, you're not going to do it in the second culture. If you're not um, having some boldness in, like, okay, I'm going for it, and you start asking them about, about God or, you know, where they're at spiritually. If you're not, if you're too afraid to do that or unable to do that in the States, then, uh, I mean, or in Canada, then you are not going to just pick it up just because you become a missionary. It's So same things with, um, if you're into things that are idolatrous, where you're looking to anything to fill, fill the heart, your heart, needs other than God, it's just going to double or triple on the mission field because you'll be lonelier or need more needy. So if you're going after anything that's not pleasing to him, you'll be tempted even more to do it then. So it's almost good to work it out, you know, in your own culture. And then, um, gosh, there's so much you could say, just, you know, get the, get the, have Jesus do a cleansing uh, you might you don't want to wait till you're on the field because then it's destructive and you know then you want to do that regularly as Christians we confess and are cleansed and forgiven mm-hmm. but do that and then um, you have to you have to, it's not bad to start working on the language while you're still preparing for the mission field because that's a lot of work um, every ounce of effort helps. Every minute you mentally are setting it builds a, you know, it's like building b- bricks that build a big thing, but it's, you don't feel like doing it. You feel like jumping on your phone in the middle, like after about 15 minutes of language study, you want a quick something funny, but it's just hard yeah. work. So it's the most disciplined thing I've ever done in my life, especially the biggest accomplishment I've ever done on my own. Like I guess I graduated from college but the language learning was not part of, it was just on my own. And I just studied for four hours a day and uh-huh. studying something that you don't learn, you just stuff it in. It's easier yeah. to learn some subject if you're studying it in English because you move. But the language you don't, you're not even in English. So it's, you're just stuffing it in. It's just, exactly. long. but not all, not all missions are across language, but, um, so I think those are some of the things to prepare. That's really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my last like official question would be, um, can you share some fruit that's come from your ministry? Um, and yeah, what are some good good moments of that has just made it seem like worthwhile? Yeah, while being here. Okay. Um, one was it was a while ago, but I had been working with six or seven different youth groups intensively and doing like seven, eight, nine camps a summer with them. And um, then we all got together for a four day conference where it wasn't, it wasn't so work. It was more for growth and being encouraged. And it was just so good to, there were a thousand kids there. And that's awesome because normally Christians 
uh, there's only four of them in a high school, uh, five of them in a high school of a thousand people. So there's sometimes you're in your class, if there's 200 kids, you're the only Christian statistically. So one out of 200. And, um, so there's thousand Christians there. It was really encouraging. Then you go walk around that whole town where we had the conference and you see one after another. And the joy was so great that I said, <clears throat> So God, hold off, because if you've ever laughed too much and too loud, you're like, I got to stop laughing. It like hurts. That hurts in your belly. But this, the joy was starting to hurt in my like upper belly. It's a strange thing, but um, it's better to give than to receive. That's why missionary life is so rewarding and so uh, joyful, because it's better to be on the service mentality than the I get mentality. At the end of each summer, I help these 900 um, North Americans come prepare for their trip after their mission. And I ask them, was this better or worse than a uh, vacation? And they they say better. They always say better. And they also say, yeah, there's a time for vacation. You need to not just, because they worked really hard for like 12 days. Um, but it was more rewarding. It was more, and that's part of Jesus saying it's better to give than to receive. So that, that's a joy. But then when I coach with guys, now I choose disciples. I don't just like, they're not assigned to me. Like if, if they don't want to grow or if they're not responsible for their own thinking or life, I, I don't work with them. I bless them or evangelize them, but I don't, um, work with them if they're unwilling to work. So that's been a great, so I work only with guys who want to grow and it's a mm -hmm. great joy and fruit at the end of the conversation, the coaching conversation, I say, what will you do with this? And then they come up with the least assignment for them, one for themselves. Because in Czech Christianity, it's a lot about knowledge, not about doing the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, And then the next time we meet, I hear either what they did or what they wanted to do but didn't do it. And then we say, what did you learn from setting it to do it but not doing it? And they, so it, you always see growth, and that's really fun. Because classic teaching as a teacher in school, you don't see, if, you don't even know if they grew or learned anything because it's, it's too many kids, the system doesn't often work. But in one-to-one -one coaching, especially if you asked, what will you do with this, you see some effect. Hmm. That's really encouraging. Um, yeah. Um, so the Czech, is there a dominant uh, religion right there now? Or is it pretty non-religious? Um, Poland is north of Czech, and it's like the most Catholic country. Um, mm -hmm. And they really make their laws according to their belief. Like it's the, Like, we've lost... Now it's only Malta and Poland that don't take babies from the womb for convenience in abortion. Uh, Ireland gave up on that last month. Northern Ireland was forced to do that. Um, and now only Malta and Poland. Czech, so it's very Catholic up there, but just across the border in, in um, Czech Republic, um, Catholic... It's not Catholic, it's not Christian, it's not Muslim, it's not anything. It's the most atheistic country, or one of the most atheistic. Statistics are hard, they're always... But it's probably the, the atheist and agnostic population is 81%. That's the best we can... But in practice, you basically don't meet a real Christian unless you meet 200 people. Then you finally meet one who really follows Jesus. So it's it's... There's... In some ways, it's nice to work on a field where there's nothing there. Whereas if you were working with religious people, you'd have to do what Jesus did and deconstruct and then construct. But Czechs are pretty, in some ways, empty. They're always, they're spiritual. They're looking for stuff. They get into stones, touching stones and reading spiritual books and thinking through Buddhism or yoga, spiritual stuff. Uh, they're looking, and so I try to direct it not to church history, but to Jesus who said, hey, come to me and you won't thirst. 
Um, come to me and you won't be hungry spiritual. spiritually. I'm the way. You won't have to keep searching the rest of your life for the way. I am the way. So no more searching, just satisfaction and more of me. So because church history is a mess in this part of the world, <clears throat> Christians fought each other for 30 years. Yeah. In the 30 years war, and it didn't end there. It's And it's still sometimes weird, like, like now that everything went to Zoom, now people turn on Zoom and look at a, a worship service, and it doesn't look to me anything like Jesus would have led. It's like uh -huh. doing activities and having statues and walking there and there and um, lighting candles. It's not about the word and worshiping God, or some of it is. It's just, it's 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 beyond what checks can grasp it's so far gone that type of christianity um i think we need jesus or a john the baptist or a paul to come through and say this is following jesus it's not all the form but it's the faith you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely well well thank you for for all of that mm -hmm. um i guess my last sort of question for you would be uh in your ministry what are a few things that I'm allowed to pray for or able mm -hmm. to pray for? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the Czech Republic is great because we don't have to like censor our words or um, hold back on prayer requests. It's totally safe. You know, religion is is protected. So, um, but pray that I'm trying to build 50 men, build and encourage 50 men who lead others. And I uh, just passed year nine out of 10. I have 10 years to do that. And so this is my last 11 months of building up 50 men. And we're on pace. So pray for that because we need more maturity. Pray for maturity in the people, especially the men. And don't. And I'm not just praying for it. I'm working towards it. I'm working one-on-one -on -one and spending time with guys. Who, so we need that. So pray for maturity and pray for 50 men by April 2021 and um, then pray for our team tomorrow they have a big meeting on what to uh, do for the summer and right. my part in that is when do I actually cross the border when will they let me is it possible to cross the border without having to sit in quarantine for 14 days it would be great if I could just return to check um, and not have to do that, but I'll do it if it's necessary. Right, right. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I'll be praying for those. Um, thank you so much for your time and mm -hmm. for spur of the moment just being able to to fill me in on, on your ministry and, and what you get to do with uh, the people of Czech. And it, it's been very encouraging to hear about this ministry. Mm.